In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Chris Clark. He's co-founder of Walla Media. He talks about how they bootstrapped the business from zero to over $2 million a month in just over three years. He also talks about his experience in the infomercial business. That and much more coming up right now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Chris Clark. Chris Clark is the co-founder of Walla Media, which is a full-service advertising agency. They bootstrap the business from zero to over two million a month in just over three years. That's amazing, Chris, by the way. He's also founder and CEO of Lexicon Digital Media Group that owns and operates several cutting edge web properties in the health and wellness space. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. I'm really excited. And you know, I get a lot of comments from people. They have tons of ideas. They don't know where to start. Or maybe they have a current product or service. They're just not getting the traction they want. And you're the perfect person to talk about going from that idea to making that first sale in dollar and then way beyond that. Um, so a fun fact, I always like to include fun fact. Fun fact about Chris is uh, he's a college dropout. Talk to <laughs> us about that decision. Uh, it was, actually, it was a pretty easy decision. Um, so I, I was always a really terrible student, like F student. Uh, I loved education. I loved to learn. Uh, and you know, I think I was the bane of my teacher's existence going through uh, high school and even prior to that. Uh, I would always get A's on tests, but I would refuse to do the homework. Hmm. And for me, um, this is where I started to have a problem with traditional education, I guess. It was a very long time ago. Uh, I would argue with the teacher that if I was acing the test, uh, that why did I actually need to do the homework? Because it was clear that I understood the material. Uh, and when the teacher said, because we told you to, um, you know, that's, that's where uh, I had a divergence, I guess, with education. So, um, no, I made it, made it barely out of high school. Uh, I think I graduated with like a 2.1 uh, cumulative GPA. Uh, and you know, I, I didn't ditch class or anything. I was always in class. Um, it was just this kind of homework issue. Hmm. Um, so how anyway, did you, so, how did you ace the test without doing the, the homework or anything like that? You just read the material just to learn it? Yeah, no, I read the material and I paid hmm. attention in class. Uh, and I interacted with people. I, you know, and I never, I never learned how to game the system like a lot of people did. I guess I was so strong-headed uh, that I was right and the teacher was wrong about this. Instead of you know these much smarter kids than me that just would, you know, copy somebody else's homework or pay them to do the homework for them. I never figured out that kind of hack. Uh, so instead, I just got really terrible grades and kind of pushed my way through. Um, so the, the college thing, I mean, it's a surprise that I even went to college in the first place, uh, to be honest, based off of that information, right? But somewhere around senior year of high school, I decided that I wanted to go to school. And I wanted to go to school for business. Um, so I told both of my parents this. Uh, both of my parents are college graduates. Uh, my dad's response was, I think that's a bad idea. To go to college? Um, or To go to college, yeah. Hmm. Uh, he said, you know, if you want to go to college and like party and, you know, meet chicks, do what I did. And, you know, you can go to school for a degree in psychology. Forget about going for business. He's like, if you want to go for business, why don't you just start a business? I thought, you know, you don't get it, obviously. Telling my mother the same thing. Uh, you know, my mom went to school of uh, engineering, master's in engineering. And um, her same response was basically like, you have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are not good at school. You don't like it. Um, I don't think that you should go to college. Hmm. Uh, and if you do, we can't pay for it anyway. So it's up to you. So basically both parents said it, it's a bad idea. Don't do it. Um, I decided, of course, they knew nothing and that I was going to go to school for business. Uh, of course, with the grades that I've already talked about, uh, you know, wasn't getting into Harvard. 
Uh, so I figured that I would start at a community college and then transfer into um, a, a normal school, CU Boulder or something like that. And uh, so I enrolled into Front Range Community College uh, and started taking classes at night while selling car stereos during the day uh, at a car audio place. Um, so I think I went to probably like three classes, maybe four, I don't know. Um, I recognized very quickly that uh, it wasn't a good environment for me. Uh, and I couldn't even stay awake through a macroeconomics class. So uh, parents were right. Uh, st school and the traditional route in college, at least in this setting, was not the right thing for me to do. Uh, plus, you know, during the day I was selling car stereos and thought I was making good money. You know, at like 18 years old, making 50 grand a year, whatever I was making, thinking I was, you know, this hot sales guy. Um, so I dropped out. Uh, and uh, never even considered going back to school again after that point. So I guess that's that's the dropout story. Yeah. I want to hear more about what you did right after you dropped out. But first, obviously, it seemed like you were always interested in business and you have a knack for business. What was it from growing up that influenced you? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I, I think it was mostly... Uh, I. I I don't know. I don't think I ever really had a knack for business. I'm still not even sure if I do. Uh, it was a lot of it was um, sales. I thought of myself as a salesperson. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I liked interacting with other people. And I guess what it really was is I enjoyed learning all about some kind of a system uh, and then solving a problem for somebody else by putting together the system properly, matching whatever budget was, and then being able to craft that and turn that into a sale. Um, strangely enough, you know, that's, that's what I did selling car stereos and that's what I did forever forward. Uh, you know, that's what has always infatuated me. Um, so it really came from sales, not business. Mm -hmm. And I thought that going to school for business would give me an opportunity to do high level sales, which at the time was mm -hmm. driven by, um, you know, I, I wanted financial success when I was a kid. That's what I was dreaming of. Yeah, so when you were younger, when did you get that first taste that sales was really, you know, you were really interested in that? Uh, I was working at a Hallmark franchise, believe it or not, uh, in the mall in Boulder. Um, and, you know, basically, this is, I was probably like 16, something like that. I was very young. I mean, I've, I've been employed basically or since I was 14 years old, I think. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, it was you know the 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 role of working at Hallmark was to basically check people out. They walk in, they buy cards or whatever, and you just check them out and send them on their way, right? Uh, and I found it much more entertaining to attempt to sell these people something more than what they came in for, and um, actually ended up becoming you know generating a lot more revenue for the store by doing that. Uh, I eventually was fired. Uh, from working there because uh, I don't know. I think the owner came in and I was having like a sword fight with uh, a <laughs> line with uh, 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 like wrapping paper. Um, so they, just, they didn't like that. They fired me on the spot. But uh, after that, I got into selling snowboards. Um, I mean, where do you get this? You know, because as a you know, I don't necessarily equate. I could be wrong. Like engineering, your mom's engineer. I don't. I don't equate engineering with strong like you got to go sell and your dad do you get that from your parents somewhat or where do you get that I, from you know my dad was a pilot um he was like a real risk taker mm -hmm. always has been he still kind of is i guess uh and my mom was much more pragmatic uh risk averse um very very smart woman uh, and I don't know, I think I landed somewhere in the middle. I think my mm -hmm. dad's probably a pretty damn good salesperson. Um, you know, and my mom is great with um, systems and solutions and keeping track of things. So I don't know. I, I kind of took like the I, best I, of both of them. Yeah, I the systems with the, the sales and uh, you got the sales system. So tell me right after you dropped out, you're 18, right? What do you do? Well, I mean, at the moment, <laughs> Uh, when I dropped out, I was selling car stereos, and I thought that you know 
I, I thought I was pretty cool because I was actually making money and all of my friends. So at the time being, I really wasn't sure. I mean, I thought that probably the move was to continue moving up to selling larger ticket items, um, you know, whether it be cars or airplanes or yachts, or, I don't know. Um, that, that's kind of what I had pictured, but I, you know, I, I didn't really have any vision. I mean, you got into the, what happened when you got into the infomercial company? So this was actually, it's pretty strange. Um, so my dad ended up meeting this guy. My dad flies um, model airplanes these days. So my dad's a paraplegic since I was oh. two. Uh, oh, wow. He's been in a wheelchair. So he stopped flying airplanes. Um, so he began flying model airplanes. Uh, and he ended up meeting this guy uh, that was always hiking by this area that he flew these model gliders. Uh, and they became friends. And this guy um, he had this newsletter business. He was teaching people about uh, this certain niche of real estate investment. And, um, you know, he was doing okay, wasn't doing that well. And uh, they became fast friends. Anyway, uh, the guy told him, hey, you know, um, I want to make an infomercial, and uh, I just don't have the money to make it. Um, and so my dad, for whatever reason, was convinced that this would be a successful endeavor and called um, everyone within our family and tried to solicit some money here and there to put together uh, funding for the infomercial, which we did. I mean, a couple thousand dollars at a time. Um, I think I put in like five grand or something. Uh, and had you know real grand aspirations for what that would turn into, um, which I didn't hear much about it for the first year or so uh, after the investment was made. But anyway, so you know, fortuitously, the the guy who took this investment to make the infomercial ended up calling me um, and asking me to come work for him, which is what you know that that was my next move. Is I quit my job selling car stereos. To go work for an infomercial company. I mean, you were doing well, so why would you quit? Because this guy sold me. Um, what was know, the he, dream? What did he sell you? No, nah, you know, he kind of. Um, it's it's an interesting close that he pulled on me. So he got me to go have lunch with him, and you know, he was telling me about uh, how this infomercial thing is going to go big and whatever. And I'm asking him like, "What is it doing now?" You know, we invested this money a year plus ago, and I haven't heard anything. Oh, well, you know, we're still working on it, but it's going to be good. You know, come work for me. Uh, we want you to do sales. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm kind of a big fish, small pond at the moment. I'm, I'm killing it. I'm making 50 grand a year, dude. And uh, he's like, you know what? It's fine. Like, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll put an ad out in the newspaper. We'll hire somebody else. And, you know, you can just sell car stairs for the rest of your life. And so that was just like a slap in the face and kind of like, brought me back to reality of like, do I want to sell a car? That just sounds bad. And, you know, at the time I was having a, a, a wonderful time. I was learning. I was making great money for, who, you know, kind of the level I was at, I guess. But it kind of shocked me. Um, and, you know, my response was like, oh, you know, okay, actually I don't want to sell car stereos the rest of my life. I just need two weeks. Like, yeah, fine, I'll come work for you. So he closed me and sold me on working for him, um, claiming I was going to have a sales position at the company. And it turned out after I quit my job and moved over to do this, there was no sales going on within the company. And I actually got to be a customer service rep, uh, fielding calls from people who had bought this thing off of the infomercial. Uh, some mad, some happy, whatever, and you know, ended up having to learn about customer service. And um, you know, I was pissed. I, you know, I always hated customer service, but it was obviously it was what I needed to do first, and it it really ended up fitting into the whole process later. So, what ended up happening? Well, so at the beginning with the infomercial company, the process was that when we launched the infomercial, basically people bought a package uh, watching this on television. This is circa 2002, so people still watched infomercials. It was a lot easier to buy media at the time uh, on TV in this manner. So people would buy the product. Um, that was all handled by a third-party call center. Uh, 
once the product was delivered, um, that user was basically passed on to another company that did sales that would upsell these people uh, on coaching, teaching them about this particular niche of real estate investment, right? And um, so this other call center uh, would convert these users into a higher value type of relationship. They'd spend, you know, two, three, five thousand dollars uh, to get some kind of coaching, and then that um, that revenue was split with us, right? So if they sold the user something for five thousand dollars, we get twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, so that was okay at the beginning, um, but as we kind of uh, amassed more knowledge, got better at customer service, and we started developing some internal products. Uh, I got to lead uh, some of the development of the internal sales team where we started to siphon off leads instead of sending them to this third party uh, process, we would send them to our own internal sales team and fulfill a product internally. Uh, this was a giant step. Uh, you know, this is this changed everything for the business. Um, and so this is, we ended up developing our own internal sales team, uh, lots of products, and basically uh, stopped sending our users to a third party. And actually the, the net result was 10 times more revenue probably, very quickly, happier customers. Um, the net result was really positive. Um, but that, that was my first kind of experience of uh, solving a problem, taking something in-house and scaling it. So how did your initial investment do? Did pretty well. You know, I probably spent five grand and it returned maybe a hundred to me or something. Um, That's great. Which is, yeah, you know, the the funny thing and, you know, you one of the things you kind of asked me um, offline, I guess, is, you know, lessons learned from the experience or maybe yeah. you're going to get there. But, Go ahead. Um, you know, I was young and my, my family and myself, the people that were involved in this, were not business people. Uh, and, you know, in making the investment and, and becoming a part of this LLC uh, that created the infomercial or funded the infomercial, really, yeah. uh, nobody really understood the contract. Um, great lesson for later in business and in life. And, you know, uh, this would have been a great time to have enlisted an attorney uh, to go through this with us. Um, anyway, so basically the way that the LLC read was that this investment um, or the ownership in the LLC was basically uh, dissolved as soon as the infomercial that we had funded ceased airing. So as you can see, that's kind of misaligned um, because the idea is you get the company rolling, increase profits. Obviously, you're going to film a better television show when you have more money to do so. Right. So as soon as a new TV show was filmed and put on air, uh, we stopped receiving any sort of uh, distribution from the business. So that obviously was... Um, uh, no stinks. one was happy about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it stung. Um, and, you know, that, that started the rift uh, between myself and the CEO uh, of the company and, and, of course, my family and the company. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that happened fairly early on. I think it was probably only like two and a half years in. Mm -hmm. And really, we hit our stride probably in the eight months uh, to a year after that. And then really scaled it up. I mean, in 2006, I think, the company did $100 million in revenue wow. uh, with good margins. Um, so at that point, though, we, we were not receiving a, a, a penny from it. That does sting. I want to hear <laughs> about then what the next state, you know, step was. But I want to go back to one point. You know, when I talked about the influences, you know, the... Part about your dad being a paraplegic had to have influenced you. Yeah, I mean, I if you don't want to talk about it and you're not comfortable, but um, that I would think would be a major influence. It's a major influence. No, and I, I'm I'm happy to talk about it. Um, you know, I think uh, the biggest influence that has more than anything. I mean, besides you know uh, growing up and having to take care of your father instead of vice versa, in a lot of ways, you know, probably forces. 
uh, wanted to grow up a little bit faster. But, um, you know, I think a, a, a really powerful thing that happened from this was that, you know, my dad's attitude on life. I remember asking him when I was really young, I was probably like six or seven, like, aren't you pissed you know, you can't walk anymore. And this is like an athletic guy. He's a pilot. You know, it's this and that. Like the guy, a lot of his identity revolved around uh, physical abilities, right? Leave it um, to kids. Just, just go right to the blunt point, right? Right for it. Yeah. yeah. Now, aren't, aren't you just pissed that, uh, you know, you can't walk anymore? You can't ski anymore? You can't fly anymore? Like there's no more skydiving? Like aren't you pissed? And his response was No. Um, no, I'm not pissed. And I, I think it took him a while to get to this point. But, um, you know, was the, the reality of his outlook is, look, I can be really pissed off at life in general, you know, and, and be mad at everybody and everything because I'm in a wheelchair and I'm in a wheelchair. Or, you know, I can enjoy life, you know, I can appreciate the things that are around me that are, are positive and wonderful, and I'm in a wheelchair, right? So, like, no matter what, I'm in a wheelchair. So, like, you may as well choose to feel good, to be happy, and to, um, you know, to, to address life uh, from that perspective. So, that was a big thing for me, you know, that, that when bad things happened or, um, not even bad, but just, you know, when, when things are tough, it's like to, to kind of check yourself. Um, they probably have it pretty good. And, you know, that if there's bad things happening or you're in a bad position, that um, realistically, like, you can have a good outlook on things and you're still in a bad position or you can have a bad outlook on things and you're still in a bad position. So it's like, this is just a choice. Yeah. So I think that was a huge influence and that helped me a lot during what, you know, um, I would interpret as hard times, uh, you know, in my life. Yeah. Business no, that's and personal that's otherwise. really powerful. I appreciate you sharing that. It's, yeah. It's, uh, your six year old self really just went right to the heart of, of the, you know, ask him. Um, so after the infomercial company, um, you entered the affiliate marketing world. What was a lesson you learned from that and what happened? A, a lesson from the affiliate marketing world? Yeah. When you, what was the next company you, you started working with? So, um, I had hired this kid straight out of college. I was the sales manager at this infomercial company. And it was this kid's first job out of college. Um, and he and I ended up becoming friends. He moved out of the sales department at the infomercial company and ended up in their kind of tech and marketing department for a while. And uh, we ended up being neighbors and, and just becoming friends. He's a little bit older than me. Uh, him and his wife lived next to me. But um, yeah, so he left the infomercial company a few years before I did and got into affiliate marketing. And we had stayed friends, and uh, he knew that I was really burnt out. Um, the infomercial company essentially, um, you know, was uh, it was really fun in the beginning as a startup, and as it gained more and more momentum, more people, more revenue, it got less and less fun. Uh, most of the talented people started to leave because there was just so much obnoxious structure and bureaucracy, um, and. I kind of came to my breaking point in 2007 where I was just, I was losing it. I couldn't do it anymore. I spent like 50 days out of the country that year. Um, and when I came to work, I was completely ineffective. Um, I, I, I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, I, I just wasn't into it. So anyway, uh, this guy that I had hired so many years ago, um, ended up starting his own affiliate marketing business and he reached out to me and was like hey like I know you're burnt out and it's time for you to do something else I have an idea come have dinner with me so we had dinner and he told me this you know whole spiel about how he'd been doing affiliate marketing um, and uh, he was doing well him and his partner were doing really well with it and um, he wanted to start an affiliate network uh, and start brokering ad campaigns between affiliates like them and other advertisers. And um, I had no idea what he was talking about. 
uh, I, I have no idea what it's another what, language yeah I have no idea what the hell you're talking about but I'm in uh, <laughs> all, all I knew is that I had to stop what I was doing uh, it wasn't working for me anymore yeah. and um, I, I needed a big change uh, so basically I said yeah I'm in I don't I don't know what you, I, I don't know what you're talking about but let's do that um, and probably maybe a couple weeks later I ended up quitting my job uh, on the spot like like here's my resignation effective now uh, after six years of being with this company having wow. invested in the infomercial and you know during that last year basically relegating myself to being totally useless at the company. Um, so yeah, so then I, uh, I left to go work for a guy that I had hired previously. He hired me and saved my ass um, from who knows what uh, at this infomercial company. And um, that was my first move into affiliate marketing where I was then tasked with building uh, a network of people who had ad campaigns that they needed traffic from affiliates on and affiliates that had traffic for ad campaigns and understanding all of the technology and language and relationships that uh, you know create that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So what was one of those relationships created that really worked, that you found that was successful? I mean, it's hard to define that. You know, these guys, luckily, um, because they had been in the affiliate marketing business for uh, a couple of years, they had some um, some experience because they were affiliates and they were generating traffic um, that they just tried to plug me in uh, to some of the people that they knew. Um, and really, you know, I, I had to set my ego aside and, you know, be able to be honest with these people that I really had no idea what I was doing. And, you know, via kind of the pity of some of these contacts, uh, they showed me what they were doing that was successful, and you know they they um, sometimes just literally out of pity would take an ad campaign that I was trying to get traffic on, and run traffic for me just because they liked me, um, and not because it was the most profitable thing to do. Uh, and so it was kind of out of those relationships of people sort of taking pity on me, uh, mostly because of my honesty of, of the fact that I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, that's how I started to learn. So what was a big lesson you learned from working in that, in that business? Um, ask questions, be honest, be authentic. Uh, you know, that, that changed everything for me. I remember, um, you know, I aming with, uh, the CEO and owner uh, of this, uh, affiliate network when I was talking to uh, a new client on IM or whatever, maybe even on the phone, and I'd be IMing him, trying to ask him, like, what is this person talking about? You know, they're talking about CPCs or what's the eCPM, you know, uh, that you're seeing on mailing this campaign to Yahoo. I'd be like, what is eCPM? And his response was, ask them. And that, to me, you know, again, like coming from the sales position and, and being very egotistical and ego driven, admitting that you didn't know what your client was talking about was like certain death, I thought. Um, and so he forced me into uh, admitting that I didn't know things and asking these questions. And it was just amazing that uh, generally people were so happy that you asked because there's so many people that are faking it uh, that don't get it. And actually in, in the affiliate industry, if you're an affiliate manager, um, faking it can be dangerous uh, for the affiliate because they can go and do a media buy or send email to their list uh, you know, based off of a recommendation that you make. And if you didn't understand the consequences of that, potentially this person can lose uh, a lot of money uh, from following your advice. So mm -hmm. usually people were relieved uh, when you asked them to explain it. So they they were happy to tell you. So that's that that was... Um, that was massive for me, and I mean that's what I taught the rest of my company as I as I founded uh, my own company after this. Um, you know that was kind of a cornerstone uh, of of what I taught people. Yeah. So tell me about the idea and the start of Walla Media. So Walla Media 
um, was founded in 2010 uh, with two other guys that uh, had been clients of mine from Diablo, which was the CPA network. Uh, they were clients of mine for a few years, so I'd worked with them quite a bit, um, sending traffic to one of their ad campaigns. Um, and it was time for me to leave um, this other company, Diablo Media. Um, you know, at that point, uh, I, I needed something different. It had been three years. The company had scaled up a lot. Um, and uh, again, you know, I was just an employee um, and, and I really needed more than that. Uh, I needed to be able to have some ownership uh, in the business. So um, my next step was founding my own company uh, along with these other guys, uh, which I moved to Los Angeles from Denver, Colorado, uh, to found the company with them. And, you know, I was lucky in starting Walla Media because there was already kind of one campaign. Um, so it wasn't called Walla Media at the time. We started a new entity and kind of transferred this ad campaign over to it. Um, and at the time, you know, this new company was actually losing money um, at a pretty good clip. Um, so uh, I was lucky in one way that there was already... Uh, uh, one campaign to work on. I was unlucky, or I, I wouldn't say unlucky, but you know, I had a, an immediate problem to fix uh, that uh, the company was losing money, and and th there was there was significant problems that needed to be fixed uh, concerning technology operations, all kinds of things that um, you know at the time I I didn't know what I was getting into actually. Um, so anyway. I, I'm not sure if that answers. Yeah. Well, question. so what was the big problem? Well, so uh, the the big problem there was there's there was too many of them. But um, you know, I thought I was going to come into the company and be able to scale the marketing because I had all of these contacts. I knew how to you know drive a lot of traffic through affiliates. Um, but when a company is operationally broken or the technology is broken, um, you can't scale. That, does, that doesn't even matter at that point. Uh, so I never thought of myself as an operations type of person. So again, it was like, you know, I got what I needed, not what I wanted. So I needed to learn operations, which I fixed. Um, the technology, which because of how I had been trained at my prior company, uh, I was able to fix. It was mostly operational. It's not me doing anything really technical, but but knowing what tools needed to be used to solve the tech problems. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, and in, 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 instead of being able to just open the doors and scale things way up, uh, you know, it took months to get the thing rolling, which you know, oftentimes is the case. Is you know, things take about three times longer than you expect them to. Was this the, the two other founders that you had? Did they already have some of these technical aspects in place? Is that where they came from? No. Uh, so both of these guys, they come from call center backgrounds, essentially. Um, so uh, essentially what we're doing is generating leads for Dish Network's retail side of the business. They've got their corporate side and they've got the retail side. And so basically what we were doing is lead gen into a call center which that call center then sold that user on Dish Network, uh, and you know we received payment from Dish Network for that. Um, so, you know, my imagination was I can just step in, scale up marketing, and you know sell ten times more uh, users to Dish Network. Not the case. Um, so, no, their background was really call center uh, operations, uh, not technology or lead generation, uh, marketing, affiliate marketing, uh, you know, they had had their hand in it a little bit, but basically I, I had run the other side of it for them from my other company. So no, they, they were, they were pretty new with this. Got it. So tell us about the first customer or first few customers. What did you do for them and how did it go? So define customer. I mean, in this case, the customer, um, for, Walla Media. Yeah, yeah, for Walla Media. You said you brought one of the customer, one of the customers that you had worked with came with you to Walla Media. Well, that really was that was my business partners in okay. these call centers for Dish Network. Gotcha. Uh, 
so that that was where things started. Uh, but we we ended up building instead of being kind of a one trick pony with just the Dish Network lead generation, uh, we ended up building out a full on uh, affiliate network and later. Um, you know the affiliate network part of it in terms of brokering third-party ad campaigns to third-party affiliates um, was was relegated by us building web properties in-house, which was really um, the largest turning point the company had, uh, and really what I worked on for the last two years, um, almost solely, uh, was that part of the business. So. Um... Then I guess just for people who don't know affiliate marketing or ad networks, essentially um, was it was a consumer finding you on the web who would then call in and want Dish Network? Kind of. Um, what we would do is basically uh, create a website, uh, you know, that's all branded for the Dish Network stuff. Uh, we would build uh, creative. Primarily, we used email marketing through third party uh, email marketers. Uh, so basically, we would provide them with email creative links, uh, and they would send an email to their list of people that uh, had opted in to receive email from them, uh, and then we would compensate uh, that marketer when a user clicked or submitted a form or or whatever the metric was that we agreed to pay them on uh, when it went to our website, and uh, then eventually to Dish Network after us. But... Um, yeah, I mean the 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 biggest thing. It does uh, seem complicated. It's <laughs> no wonder you had operations <laughs> issues. <laughs> yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, well, that was like just the beginning. Because you can't control the Dish Network, then they have their own call center, right? I mean, you're not controlling the call center. We were controlling. Well, I mean, uh, yes and no. Uh, so this is there's two sides to Dish Network, which one is their in-house kind of corporate side, which is not what we were servicing. And the other side is the retail side of the business. They're basically um, marketing partners that generate sales for Dish. And the, the revenue for Dish Network is split almost 50-50 between those two channels. Mm -hmm. So uh, the third party uh, is, is just as big as their corporate. But um, So yes, we had a lot of control over the call center, but also you know, Dish dictates what you can and can't do. It's very restrictive, which is one of the reasons... Um, I set out to build other web properties that Walla Media owns that could be more flexible. Um, you know, I, I liked having the control of being our own largest client uh, and having a, a great degree of control over what you do with that user, how it's monetized, um, you know, the margins that you can earn on it, um, all kinds of things. Um, you know, the affiliate network model is take a third party campaign, you know, uh, let's say Allstate Insurance, for example, uh, is my client. They're going to pay me $10 for every form that gets submitted by a user interested in getting um, insurance quotes on uh, their home, whatever. Um, so they're going to pay me $10. I'm going to then take that ad campaign and give it to one of my affiliates that either has an email list or they're buying traffic off the search engines or they've got a Facebook group, whatever. Uh, and I'm going to pay them $8 every time they generate uh, a lead uh, for Allstate, and I take that $2 in between, right? So that's where the margin of an affiliate network is generated typically, um, which is fine. I mean, you can multiply $2 you know, over thousands of times a day, or you can have thousands of campaigns, uh, and you can aggregate that into you know, significant amounts of profit, um, but it's tough. So, you know, taking a page out of the infomercial right. process, you know, instead of outsourcing uh, the upsells, uh, we brought it in-house and built our own upsells and products. Uh, we did the same thing at Wall Media. So, you know, we used to send uh, a lot of traffic in specific uh, verticals, um, jobs for one thing. So a lot of people... Um, we were sending traffic to job sites, lots of people looking for jobs over the last few years. And, you know, the, the payout on this is like a dollar fifty or something for every user that joins a job site. So I'm getting a dollar fifty, I'm paying a dollar twenty, you know, you're making twenty cents. It's not much. You have to do very large volume uh, to make that make sense. So the next step was build our own job sites. 
right? So we started to build our own web properties, whether it was jobs, there's personal finance sites. Um, in the verticals that we were strongest in brokering campaigns, we built a team in-house to do the creative, do the technology to manage the data uh, and monetize the user ourselves uh, rather than just passing it through to a third party. Um, that was a huge jump uh, in terms of um, revenue and profitability for the company. Um, and the third and final piece that was accomplished while I was still uh, the CEO of the company uh, was taking over our email marketing in-house uh, as well. Uh, so we kind of owned the funnel at that point. So from um, the user data being submitted, everything that happened with that user experience going into our database, uh, remarketing to that user uh, through our own internal email um, management um, that's where profits really jumped up. Um, but basically, you know, the idea of this is to, you know, whatever you're choosing to do, uh, you know, the more of the process you can own, the better. Obviously, there's inherent risks for taking these responsibilities, but, um, you know, I, I don't feel like it's, it's the only way to do it for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I want to own the process and the more that you can close the loop and depend on other people less, um, you know, the greater your profitability and your greater your control is going to be. So when you were, Chris, when you were setting up these, the web properties, kind of taking everything in house, what did, what worked really well that you're still surprised about? Um, huh. I guess, uh, Really, the email marketing. I, you know, I, I had been surrounded by email for years, but it was always arm's length. It was my affiliates that were sending uh, email on our behalf, mm -hmm. and I was paying them uh, either for the clicks or for a lead driven or for a sale, uh, and you know, never actually handling those operations internally until this point. Um, and the profitability of doing email in-house blew my mind, um, continues to do so looking at Wall of Media. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's one piece of advice for anybody who's watching this that is, is building any sort of uh, a user base, get their email address and communicate with them, do it yourself. Um, you know, that email is not dead, uh, and, and it's one of the easiest ways to, to create a, a profitable company is by uh, being able to communicate with your users on email. Yeah. yeah, that's good advice. And, I mean, someone out there may be like, well, Chris, I've been toiling away, and I have accumulated 100 emails. How did you, what did you find the most effective to actually, you know, gain that or get that database built up? Um. You need a hook. Um, first off, I mean, there has to be some sort of reason for the user uh, to be submitting their email to you in the first place. Um, you know, th that's that's kind of number one. Um, number two, you know, I, I guess you know uh, uh, my advantage was just access to a lot of traffic to begin with. Um, so. Uh, you got to go find the traffic. You got to get the hook, and you have to be able to mm -hmm. find the traffic. Um, but uh, you know, and and don't be afraid to test, and and don't be afraid to break even on, on some media spend or even lose some money. Um, obviously, not everybody is starting with a large budget here, but without any sort of um, data. Uh, that tells you, you know, what what happens when you pay for traffic, mm -hmm. or what happens when people submit their email. Um, you know, you'll you'll probably never know. So, you know, even if it's a small budget, um, figure out how to start doing some uh, paid um, media and user acquisition, uh, and then communicate with those users and find out what they're worth. Yeah. So when you say access to traffic, give people an example of what that what that means. Well. I so because I had run affiliate networks for so many years, I mean, I just knew a lot of guys that had millions of emails uh, that had opted into their lists. So, um, you know, that, that kind of access, access is priceless and pretty hard to get. 
Uh, but I think, you know, these days, um, it, times are different than when I started. Uh, and, and, you know, for whatever product or service you are providing, you could probably go find uh, a Facebook group or, you know, use social media to kind of hunt down somebody that already has users mm -hmm. uh, of this type. Uh, and see if you can potentially work out some kind of a joint venture where, you know, if you're selling something uh, and the product has real value, um, and you can find alignment with somebody else that has uh, a following uh, or a user base, um, you know, make a deal. And, I, you know, people uh, in kind of the info marketing space might call it a, a joint venture. Um, you know, uh, you can find somebody that, that has access to users that would be interested in your product. And, you know, if you're selling something, maybe offer uh, the person who would promote the product to their users uh, 100% of the revenue, uh, yeah. you know, just so you can get some information, right? Get some data on what a user is worth. Um, really valuable. So, Chris, what do you think? Now, I mean, you you guys bootstrap this from zero to over two million dollars a month. What do you think some of the key things were that helped with that growth? Obviously, taking things in house, like you mentioned. What else do you attribute that? I mean, that's a wildly successful, huge growth in just three years. So, I mean, the the process of closing the loop is uh, massive. I mean, you know, also the, that changed profitability completely. You know, an average affiliate network uh, may earn 10 to 15 percent. I mean, you're, you're really fighting for uh, pennies uh, and you have to do very large volume to aggregate that into something that makes sense. Um, so taking things in house allows you to expand margin, which, which was very, very big for us. Uh, I won't disclose what Walla Media's margin is, but... It's good. It's a lot better than 10% these days. Um, so uh, taking things in-house, own the funnel, um, that, that's massive. Uh, email marketing, massive. Um, and I think uh, relationships, you know, that's, been, that's always been the key for me um, is, is just relationships, finding out, you know, who uh, you're really in alignment with in your given space, um, and, and and for me, like I'm I'm a pretty introverted guy. I'm not extroverted whatsoever. I don't like networking. Like take me to a conference and put me in a room with, you know, 300 people that might do something positive for my business, and I still don't want to talk to anybody except for maybe the two or three people that I know. Um, and it's how I am. So, you know, for me, uh, I, I strictly identify people that I like doing business with. Uh, people that I can align with. And, you know, sometimes you can't do business with them right now, but if you like them and you're in alignment, uh, you know, oftentimes spending time with guys, or girls, uh, ladies, um, you know, who uh, are, are in the sector that, that you are doing business in or want to do business in, um, you know, build the relationships with them, hang out with the people that they like and that they do business with, yeah. you know, and, and that's, that's, that's been really the key um, to scale and longevity. And I guess one last factor is share your knowledge and connect people um, even when you don't get any benefit from it uh, immediately. Uh, be extremely open and transparent about it. Um, and you know, I found that to come back to me hundreds of thousands of times over when I connected two other people that ended up doing business, you know, one way or another that came back to me. So, you know, actively, uh, you know, leverage your network to help other people without any sort of instant gratification from it, without any expectation even uh, uh, of getting something back from it. Um, you know, and I, I think that's, that's been another massive piece uh, of the puzzle for me. Yeah. So what's been, Chris, a big, um, roadblock or pitfall that you've run up against? Because I know, we know it's not always been that easy. You know, it just just happened. Like, oh, I went from zero, I bootstrapped this. There's problems along the way. What's been some big problems that you've had to overcome? Um, you know, I, I think originally the big problems were obviously just not knowing the space and not knowing anybody. You know, things become a lot easier um, once you 
know people, you understand the process, people know who you are and you have a, a reputation, you know, it's, it becomes much easier after that. So I think kind of breaking into mm-hmm. a business uh, is, is one of the hardest parts. And of course, creating a reputation during that break-in period, uh, you know, of being someone that's honest, uh, transparent, that people can depend on, you know, getting a reputation uh, as someone that connects other people, um, you know. But breaking in is very hard, especially for someone like me that's fairly introverted. I hate cold calls, hate them. Uh, you know, I think that uh, the opportunities uh, have opened up a lot, you know, for, for connecting with people these days through social media and LinkedIn. LinkedIn was huge for me because it made it kind of less of a cold call uh, to connect with people that way. Um, so, you know, kind of my general disposition uh, of not really wanting to go out and talk to lots of people and just not being comfortable with that uh, was always a pitfall. Um, so who was an know, influential person or a person that you connected with that helped you break in? Do you remember one of those? Um There's so many of them. I mean, you know, it's it's it, I, I, it's hard to pinpoint one because it's kind of been this networking effect over time where people just graciously introduced me to other people kind of one by one by one uh, and that accumulated, you know, uh, greater mass and just made it easier where people come to me more. Um no, I, I can't. I can't give you maybe one person to attribute things to. I mean, not necessarily one, but one that you see is has been influential and kind of helped along the way. Because people often think, well, I need you know one by one by one is not enough. You know, they go, well, I need to blast out a bunch of people, or you know, and and you know, the reality is that personal one on one touch is, is huge. I, I mean, I actually think it just takes one sometimes, but, you know, I think, um, yeah, just putting one foot in front of the other, right, and, like, get your ass on LinkedIn and search down people within the business. You know, the thing is, on LinkedIn, almost anyone will say yes to connecting with you. Um, you know, Facebook is a little bit more personal, although these days a lot of people are, are openly connecting, but but LinkedIn is, is like such an easy way in because most people, you know, are, are a little bit ego driven and like their number of connections or whatever. And it's really like they're not sharing that much private information. So, you know, I, I would, if you're, if you're going to do something, you know, um, finding contacts that are influential in your space via LinkedIn, connect them and then sending them some kind of very personalized message that maybe gives them something or, or creates intrigue that doesn't just ask for something um, is the best way to open things. And that I guess that is, that's probably one of the, the biggest ways that I was able to build my network and start relationships with influential people that opened up the doors for me in the affiliate business was just one by one LinkedIn you know, finding them who uh, are other people like them on LinkedIn hooking them in and just going one by one and kind of following the breadcrumbs. So what other roadblocks did you hit? You know, a lot of people can relate to that. They're introverted. It's hard to meet people. What's another roadblock you've hit um, with Walla Media? Cash flow. Um, you know, it's one of those things that you really need to pay attention to in your business and especially in the affiliate marketing business uh, simply because oftentimes how you monetize a user uh, it's going to take longer to get paid on that uh, than uh, than it's going to cost you to acquire them. Meaning you you have uh, inequality in your terms. You have to pay for traffic uh, thirty days before you're going to end up receiving payment uh, potentially. So it can create a float. Uh, so that's something as you scale, you really have to be aware of. Um, so absolutely paying attention to your cash flow, um, making sure that uh, potentially if you need uh, money that, you know, have access to a line of credit or whatever, I mean, be, be prepared for scale. And, and hopefully um, you're keeping that in mind as you're starting your business is that, um, you know, that uh, don't start a business if it can't be scaled, first of all. Um, you know, if, if, if you can't attain scale, 
uh, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, and second, you know, if you're going to have cash flow problems, potentially uh, address them long before they happen. Um, so that's that's a big one. Um, you know, I remember uh, back this is years ago. I mean, the the company is is great on cash these days, but um, you know, a long time ago, it was like sifting through the checks and figuring out like what you could pay last or whatever and like who has to be paid now or first you know and and it's something that was a, a good lesson to to attempt to avoid that uh at all costs and and along with cash flow you know something that goes along with that is is really doing a good job of keeping your expenses low um you know in that startup period until you actually have uh significant income um you know wait to go buy your bends or whatever it is like keep the money in the bank and, and use it for scale um and and be prepared for potential problems you yeah. know so on that on that note you know going from some of the roadblocks pitfalls once you um are doing well what uh what do you treat yourself to <laughs> you know um it's funny because as i was pretty lucky as a kid um you know, going through this whole process with the infomercial company. You know, in 2002, when I started there at 18, there was 12 of us. When I left in 2007, there was like 300 plus people. Wow. Um, you know, we scaled the thing way up, and I ended up being the beneficiary of, of, of making a pretty good income, you know, at like 23 years old, you know, making deep into the six figures um, and spending every penny of every it penny. on probably more than every penny. Uh, you know, I got really caught up uh, in kind of like um, cars and going out, you know, it was always like bottle service at the clubs. And, um, you know, I, I grew up um, not having a lot of money uh, and not understanding how to manage it whatsoever. Um, you know, and I was, I really got into this trap, right, of, um, you know, trying to prove to everyone around me that I was successful. And of course, I had a chip on my shoulder. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of it came from just um, uh, insecurity uh, and, and really uh, a, a lack of, of, of knowledge of how to deal with, you know, what was happening. So anyway, uh, you know, it was like Range Rovers and nice places and spending money eating out every night. And, and it didn't matter how much money I was making. I could spend all of it times two probably. Um, and at some point years ago, uh, now, luckily, uh, I really had an epiphany that, you know, that was just digging a hole and, and, and really was not, um, my life wasn't any better uh, because I had an expensive car, um, you know, and and really uh, I got brought back to earth uh, when I left that company and I had to start at ground zero in affiliate marketing. And um, it really it taught me that spending money on experiences um, really dwarfs uh, buying things or having things. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that um, that is huge advice also, you know, that uh, if, if you're making money, you know, don't be afraid to spend it on yourself. But I would say spend it on travel, spend it on, mm -hmm. you know, things that are going to develop your character, um, you know, spend it on, uh, on, on making yourself uh, better uh, and, and becoming more of the person that you kind of envision in the future. Um, you know, and, and if at some point you want, I, no offense to having a nice car, like I like cars just fine. Uh, you know, I like having a nice place to live, but, you know, I think that, um, spending your money on experiences and, you know, uh, here's another big thing is, is spending money on high quality food and, uh, you know, making sure that you're well fed, that you are relaxed, uh, you know, those are things that are going to help you with the rigors of starting a business or, you know, an, any of these things. So you learned, you got it out of your system early on. And so what's in the past few years, what's been experience that you've uh, spent money on that has been amazing? Um, I mean, travel. 
uh, really travel and food uh, are, are the biggest things for uh, my girlfriend and myself, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, we, it's like almost why I even work and care to make money more than anything. I'm, I, I have a drive uh, to build businesses and to help people and, and those sort of things. But really, like the financial um, value is best equated when I look at my ability to travel the world um, and, you know, uh, and to eat really, really great food. So what's one of your favorite places to travel? Favorite places to travel? Um, God, this, it's hard to say. So many, but um, we just got back from Costa Rica. Uh, we were out there for a few weeks. Um, visited a friend uh, that's lived there for 10, 15 years. I actually worked at the calls at the uh, infomercial company, um, and uh, we're at like a yoga retreat for uh, a week or so. But Costa Rica was just beautiful. I mean, the the um, generally the people just extremely warm and friendly. Uh, the roads are absolutely terrible, uh, which is fun. Like if you're, you know, we, we rented a car and drove uh, everywhere. So I got my rally driving certificate. Uh, <laughs> so I, I had a hell of a lot of fun actually driving on the crappy roads. Um, no, and just, just at large, you know, the lifestyle there is very, very relaxed yeah. and, and, and warm. Yeah. I mean, talk about eating well, relaxed. Tell us what part of your daily routine should everyone be doing? What's a, what's a typical day look like for Chris? So a typical day, um, I don't wake up to an alarm clock. I haven't in, I don't know, it's been a while. Um, at some point, I found that upgraded the quality of my life significantly, and I had a, uh, an opportunity to do that. I can see uh, that being a good upgrade, yeah. It's huge, man, and actually, you know, uh, obviously, I think you know from kind of reading about me, I'm, I'm into like ancestral nutrition and you know paleo stuff, um, and trying to reduce modern stress, despite the fact that I work on a computer all the time. Um, you know, not waking up to some crazy annoying sound uh, <laughs> increases the quality of my life, uh, and generally, I wake up at about seven a.m. Um, it's still pretty early for not having an alarm clock. Yeah, um, you know, so I think getting up without an alarm clock uh, and something I've done for a long time uh, is I take the time to make breakfast at home every single day um, and, uh, you know, it consists of usually some nice uh eggs and meat, basically fats, proteins, uh, not much carbohydrates, uh, so I make sure that every single day I have a really awesome breakfast. So no matter what happened, even back when I was working in an office, um, you know, if I went out to lunch or whatever, I knew that I was I was making sure that I started the day with really high quality food, um, and uh, I took I, I take my morning slow. You know, I take my dog for a walk. Um, I make coffee or some tea and I eat and you know that's that's my morning ritual uh that I think anyone that can do that would benefit from it uh you know health wise reducing your stress kind of setting yourself up to take uh the day kind of more at your pace rather than what gets thrown at you and uh also from a nutritional perspective um just feeling better and having more energy so what else what, 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 else? what else besides the health aspect? What else part of your day do you have in there because it's so important? Um, I don't know. I mean, I listen to music and I, I try and get outside uh, as frequently as possible. You know, I've got a dog, so she kind of helps me get off my ass and get away from the computer because she has to go to the bathroom. Um, so that's that has been helpful for me. Um, since I started working uh, in the affiliate space so many years ago, um, just having to take her out and walk. Um, so I walk a lot. Uh, I think everybody can benefit from that. And, um, you know, I'm in Santa Monica, California, so I attempt to go to the beach frequently. Uh, and that's also, you know, again, it helps me deal with stress and stay relaxed and get vitamin D and, you know, uh, stay chill in the face of uh, hecticness and yeah. chaos. So you're always at the computer, Chris. What 
software or tools do you recommend people use or that you use frequently? Um, you know, it's funny because I am as a guy that has been in kind of the tech space for so long, mm -hmm. I'm definitely not on uh, the cutting edge of uh, adopting new technologies, tools, and gadgets. Like I finally got an iPhone 5 uh, S like the other month just because my 4 was finally basically not working anymore and that's that's sort of how it works so I don't know if anyone can take tips from me on like productivity. Well maybe it's the opposite maybe they should get rid of something. Maybe yeah I mean I think being obsessed with systems and you know um, I think Tim Ferriss kind of talks about it in the 4 hour work week which I enjoyed which is there's a difference between being efficient and being effective um, you know, and if you are efficient at doing things that don't progress your day, um, you're just wasting time. So, uh, you know, get effective and focus on just doing things that are going to move the dial for you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't use any crazy gadgets or tools, you know, obviously all of the Google docs and, you know, those basic tools that Google provides are awesome. One thing I've found, uh, for kind of team or product or excuse me project management uh, that's really helpful uh, is Basecamp which I think everybody knows about. Uh, Trello is another free one that's really awesome. We use it Walla Media. Um, scaled really well. Um, so yeah I mean I, I, I can't say that I have any uh, amazing tools or insights on this. So Chris I have one last question before I ask it Tell us a little bit more about what you're working on now. What are you excited about? Sure. Yeah, so I resigned from Walla Media as CEO uh, in November of last year. Um, the company is scaling. I mean, it's literally one record-breaking month after another. Um, more employees, more uh, more technology, more everything. And, and frankly, I'm not cut out to be the CEO of a, a large company. Um, the COO, who uh, had been with us for years, took over that position. She's, frankly, much better suited for it than I am. Uh, I'm not good uh, at running large companies. I'm not, again, I'm not operationally minded. I can fix things when they need to be fixed, but it's just not my strength. Um, so it, it was pretty clear uh, at that point that uh, I needed to do something else, that Walla Media I had taken it basically as far as I was personally capable of. Uh, I still own uh, a big chunk of it. Uh, I'm on the board, um, you know, and I, I consult them and help them uh, as they need it, but they, they don't need much from me these days. Um, so in uh, November, uh, I also launched my new business, which is Lexicon Digital Media Group. Um, Lexicon is uh, a company that holds uh, a few web properties that have been around for a few years. Um, I brought them into Walla Media. But because of my focus on other things at Walla, I just never got my stuff together to grow these things uh, and focus on them. And really, so uh, the web properties are uh, paleosecret.com, which is a blog, um, uh, again, about kind of ancestral health, um, optimal nutrition and lifestyle stuff. Uh, that's been around for a couple of years. Most of... Um, most of the content is written by a couple of friends of mine that are, you know, co-founders and authors of Paleo Secret, um, that are doctors of physical therapy in Austin, that are totally cutting edge, and the stuff they're doing is mind blowing and awesome. Um, so Paleo Secret is one. Uh, we just released uh, our first product under paleosecret.com, uh, which is the 30-day challenge and a cookbook. So a bunch of really incredible information to help people um, get healthy, lose weight uh, via getting healthy, have more energy, um, generally live better, uh, avoid a lot of um, you know modern diseases of uh, civilization. And... Um, so that's Paleo Secret, uh, which is super exciting. There's a good amount. We've got like 40,000 followers on Facebook. Um, the blog gets a decent amount of traffic. Uh, I also own Paleo.net, which is not I, but Lexicon uh, Digital Media Group owns Paleo.net, which has not launched yet. If you went there, it would just forward to Paleo Secret, but that will be an aggregation site uh, where we will be pulling in uh, all kinds of information from the uh, ancestral health space. So that's a good domain together. name. 
I think it's a great domain name. Um, I've had it for like eight months and haven't done a damn thing with it. Uh, so it's it's time to launch that soon here. But uh, yeah, we'll be pulling in awesome content from doctors and scientists and chefs. And it, it'll be a really fun place for people that are interested in this type of lifestyle to go. Um, yeah, and so we, we've got a few others that uh, are, are um, still kind of uh, top secret. But those those are the big ones. Uh, those are things that uh, people can go to paleosecret.com right now uh, and paleo.net uh, in the next month or two. Yeah, we'll definitely link that up and people can check it out. And I did. I saw that pretty banner at the, or header at the top with the 30-day or a 30-day challenge uh, uh, that, yes. that you could sign up for. Yep. Um, so, Chris, I really appreciate your time. Uh, you know, some great, valuable advice. One last question I had for you is I know, I remember reading somewhere where, you know, you really are into and are good at cultural development and leadership through the culture in the business. Can you tell people a little bit about how you implement that? Because you seem yeah. to keep these friendships too. Like you visit, you know, the guy, you know, the people you work with and wants to hire you and then you visit your friend in Costa Rica. So tell us some of, some of that because people are trying to create that great environment at work. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I, again, like with Walla Media, I, I set out to create a company that I would personally want to work for. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a company that, um, you know, that would be exciting for me to come and if, if I was coming to an office that I would be excited to come to that office mm -hmm. and work for that company. And, um, you know, if the people that are watching are building teams in house, uh, or they already have teams in house and are, are attempting to kind of wrangle them to do what they want them to do, you know, I think the number one thing for me was treat people like adults, uh, trust them. Um, you know, we have an unlimited paid time off policy. Like, we're not tracking it. You know, I don't care how many days you take off a year. Like, take off lots of them, please. Uh, you know, make things really merit-based. Um, you know, so many company cultures are based around really uh, old traditions that are completely worthless, like nine to five or eight to f Like, who cares what those hours are? Like, you know, it, it should be about production. Uh, people should be judged based off of the results that they get. Um, you know, giving people uh, the opportunity to take responsibility. You, people will blow your mind. Uh, you know, when when you give them a chance uh, to own something. So you know, I think uh, really just treating people like you know the. the you expect them to excel and, you know, uh, make sure your hiring practices have to be on point. Obviously, this is this goes behind uh, having great hiring practices. But, you know, once you hire a talent, talented person, let them be talented and do their thing. Mm. Uh, be transparent and, and, and give them, uh, you know, uh, enough rope to hang themselves. And, and if, they, if, if they do, you've got to get rid of them, obviously. But, you know, we really found... Um, turnover at well media is like nil it like it just doesn't really happen um you know we had to get rid of a few people along the way that weren't great fits and that was an educational process for us uh, mostly about our own hiring uh you know and, and we had to take responsibility for being bad at hiring the people weren't bad it was us that we, we just weren't good at hiring mm -hmm. but uh, that's that's what i would say is is transparency and, and allow people uh the opportunity to do their thing and don't micromanage them Who's going to want to leave a job with unlimited paid vacation? I, uh, you know, I think it's, <laughs> it's 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 a great benefit, right? But you know, the thing is, it's the the culture is the antidote to, or good culture is the antidote to politics and uh, you know all of the garbage that happens at at a lot of um, traditionally run companies. So you know, if you have a strong culture, people love where they work. They feel like they're dialed in to what's actually happening, that you're not lying to them and you're being honest about the state of the company. Um, people will love you for that, you know, and give them an opportunity to shine. And, uh, you know, I think that that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Chris, I just want to be the first one to thank you. Where can people, where should people go to thank you or find out more? Uh, it's a good question. I think LinkedIn probably is the best place to do it. I don't know if I have like a short uh, LinkedIn 
uh, address is probably LinkedIn forward just, slash. It's a Chris. Just look for Chris Clark on LinkedIn, and uh, they'll find you there. Yeah, I think if you look for Chris Clark on LinkedIn, um, you'll find me. That's the easiest place. I don't use Twitter, um, so yeah, find find me at LinkedIn. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys all for listening. Yeah.